good day. So, our the topic for today is network security. Uh, as the uh, network is becoming ubiquitous in the sense that it is becoming widely available to people, many people have started uh, giving services through network and these services are crucially dependent on uh, security. For example, you want to do a bank transaction uh, uh, through the network so that from anywhere you can log on to the network and uh, do your banking. Now, this banking service of course, is uh, very, very um, uh, sensitive so that if security is breached, then the whole uh, thing falls down. So, today I mean security once again is a very uh, big topic. So, today we will talk uh, just uh, some overview of some security features in networks. So, network security, what is it? What is the purpose of a network? It moves bit from A to B and this movement, we want this securely. And what exactly do we mean that uh, secu uh, securely? Well, uh, of course, then bits from A to B must reach, or bits from A must reach B, but we also want confidentiality in the sense that only A and B see bits. Uh, that means, there is, uh, if there is some, someone in between, he cannot uh, find out about the communication about the content of the communication from A to B, because it may be, I mean A may be a client and B may be a bank. Uh, so, uh, so, this has to be secure. Integrity, the message must reach from A to B intact, uh, that means without any modification on the way, that is a once again very important for m many kinds of services. And then Sitting at B, of course, you are getting some message uh, down uh, down the network, but maybe you want to make sure that this is really from A. So, that is another issue. So, these are sort of integrity issue and whether the messages are coming in order. <coughs> and then finally, availability, uh, and B gets it in time. That means, uh, when uh, B wants something from A, uh, he uh, is able to get it. It is not just uh, the even if as we will see that if uh, network security is breached, even if all the other lower layers are working perfectly, uh, B may not get the service from A or vice versa. So, these are the three main issues confidentiality, integrity and availability. So, we will look into these and how they are handled. Now, network security of course, uh, this I mean uh, there has been a lot of work on network security and uh, it is a very active research area at present. Uh, so, uh, the people have come up with uh, lots of solutions, but of course, as solutions come up uh, new problems also get generated uh, as we will see. Now, the confidentiality can be handled through encryption, that means instead of sending the message as it is you encrypt it in some fashion, so that even if somebody uh, intercepts this message uh, and gets a copy of that, he will not be able to decrypt it. So, we will see various encryption techniques that we will see. So, this encryption basically is the fundamental way in which we handle confidentiality. Integrity, integrity may be handled through what are known as digital signatures and uh, of course, Retransmission and um, uh, uh, getting the messages in order, uh, that is a uh, part of TCP uh, protocol if you are using. So, that is uh, handled by that. So, retransmission and order and availability, uh, this has to do with the quality of service and uh, sometimes even the very availability of service, uh, we will see about that. Now, security environment, uh, now um, this also has to do a, um, I mean is closely linked not just with the network nodes, but the operating systems of the system, because now of course, we are going talking about the, um, I mean mostly um, the application layer, although uh, uh, the security has become so important 
that uh, nowadays there are some network nodes also for example, routers etcetera which can uh, say encrypt messages uh, at uh, almost worse, worse speed. So, that kind of things are also there, but uh, a lot of these security issues are handled near the application layer where uh, so operating systems have to uh, have a role to play and the goals of course, we have already talked about and someone attempts to subvert the goals. It may be for fun, it may be for commercial gain, it may be with some malicious intent. Uh, so, so, exposure of data. So, if we just make a matrix of goals versus threats. Uh, so, data confidentiality, exposure of data is the threat. Data integrity, tampering with data is the threat and system availability. This may be, there may be denial of service kind of attack by some malicious people. Um, so, either for malice or for fun that is uh, that threatens system availability. Now, what kinds uh, of intruders are there? There may be casual prying by non-technical users out of curiosity. There may be snooping by insiders um, often motivated by curiosity or money. Uh, as a matter of fact, it has been estimated that for uh, most of the security serious security breaches, uh, some insider uh, is involved okay, in a majority of the cases. So, that is a very uh, and of course, when that happens, it becomes more difficult uh, to handle it, but anyway. So, that is also uh, a threat. Determined attempt to make money may not even be an insider. So, it may could be an insider, it may be someone from outside who wants to just make money and commercial or military espionage. This of course, is very big business. The military communication of course, traditionally have been confidential. So, they were encrypted. So, encryption basically derives its history as we will see from uh, on the uh, for military purpose and nowadays in the age of information, information uh, technology is a very core part of uh, the military machine of uh, any country. Okay. So, um, uh, security breach uh, in these cases is of course, very serious and uh, since uh, most of the large commercial houses, uh, they are now networked. Uh, so, uh, and as they have networked uh, on the one hand of course, you um, deal with your business process in a much more efficient manner, but on the same time uh, you expose yourself to this kind of new threats which have to be handled. Now, as uh, I mentioned that for confidentiality cryptography is a time honored technique. The only thing that has happened as is that cryptography has become more and more sophisticated because nowadays with the help of uh, computers if you are using the older techniques it is possible to crack those uh, uh, encrypted messages. Uh, so, now people have also come up with uh, better uh, encryption algorithms and be better encryption techniques. Um, so, the goal is to inf uh, keep information from those who are not supposed to uh, see it. You can do this by scrambling the data okay, and uh, use a well known algorithm to scramble data. The algorithm usually has two inputs the data and key. Key is known only to authorized users. Now, relying upon the secrecy of the algorithm is a very bad idea. Okay. So, there have been uh, cases. So, uh, I'm, uh, I mean if, if you have an algorithm for um, just an algorithm and if you think that the algorithm is going to be secret uh, that becomes very, very vulnerable because all your communication is going to use that same algorithm. Uh, so, it becomes very difficult uh, to ensure that the algorithm will indeed remain uh, secret. So, uh, uh, the modern cryptography depends on the secrecy of the key uh, as the as its mainstay and cracking codes is very difficult as we will see uh, so uh, and, uh, with uh, modern encryption techniques. First some basics of cryptography, actually we have two algorithms in general. So, this is the scenario in general. So, we have uh, two uh, 
um, algorithms E and D, which we will assume that E and D are known. That means, E and D are not only known to the sender and the receiver, but uh, whoever wants to hack into it or whoever wants to intercept it, he also may be he knows E and D. We will go with that assumption. Of course, if he does not that is better, but uh, we will go with the assumption that E and D are known uh, to everybody. Now, there are two keys K E and K D, these of course, are kept secret. So, keeping these keys secret uh, is a very important part uh, of any uh, crypto system. Um, so, and how to distribute the keys that it by itself uh, is a topic for discussion of course, we will not go into this. So, let us assume that these keys K E and K D, now K E is for encrypting the message. Uh, and uh, KD uh, is the uh, is uh, this key is used for decrypting the message. In general, KE and KD may be different. Well, in some cases they are same, some cases they are different. Now, for this to be effective, the cipher text should be the only information that is available to the world, and plain text is known only to the people with the keys. In an, uh, so this is of course in an ideal world. So this is what is happening. So, we have got let us say some plain text here, we, which we want to send in a very um, secret fashion over the network. So, what we do is first with the encryption key K E and the encryption algorithm E, we encrypt this. So, as we encrypt the plain text, we get what is known as a cipher text C. So, C is equal to E of P that is the plain text and the K E and that is the encryption algorithm. And then the cipher text is uh, sent. Uh, the idea is that um, even if somebody uh, intercepts the cipher text, since he would not be having K E, he will, it will not be possible to for him to produce P, or it will be very very difficult for him to produce P. And on the other side, uh, uh, there is a decryption key K D, and using D, uh, using the algorithm D and K D, we decrypt the cipher text to get the plain text back. So, this is the encryption part and this is the decryption part. So, it should be very hard or impossible to find out the message without knowing the key and it should be very easy and fast to find out the message knowing the key. If it is also difficult to find uh, the message even if you know the key or if it is if it takes a long time then it becomes very inefficient. So, for uh, to handle efficiency uh, we should um, this should be fast if the key is known. Uh, before looking at modern uh, um, encryption techniques let us look at some classical encryption techniques. Uh, so, there are actually two approaches one is a substitution technique the letters of the messages are replaced by other letters or by numbers or symbols. Okay and transposition techniques perform some sort of permutation on the message letters. Okay. Now, these two of course, are very uh, basic techniques and they are uh, still used today, but in a more much more sophisticated uh, fashion. Those of you who have I mean you may have come across this kind of encryption in uh, some detective stories may be at least in some of the classical detective stories, where a message may have been encrypted in using this fashion. Uh, one of the earliest known use of a substitution cipher uh, was by Julius Caesar. So, this is known as Caesar cipher. So, suppose the message is meet me after the party uh, and your um, C is equal to m plus 3 mod 26 all right. Uh, if C is equal to m plus 3 mod 26 mm, mm, in this particular case. So, m becomes M N O P, N O P, E becomes F G H. So, meet me after the party becomes P H H W P H D I W H U etcetera, which looks absolutely uh, gibberish uh, to anybody. But of course, uh, with the help of modern computers trying out the various possibilities, it is very very easy to uh, crack this code. So, this is uh, of course, uh, no longer used. So, this is just uh, kind of history. And the other is some uh, use any permutation of the 26 
alphabetic characters. Okay. You I mean Caesar cipher as you know that all of them are being displaced by the same amount by say 3 letters. In mono alphabetic cipher uh, this need not be so. So, you have basically uh, A B C D E F G H etcetera uh, it may be any permutation of uh, the same set of letters. And if so now uh, for decrypt for encryption as well as for decryption uh, you must have this table this mapping from A to Q, B to E, C to R etcetera. Now, under attack U becomes as you see C, N becomes W, uh, D becomes Y. So, C, W, Y, U, L, Q etcetera. So, this uh, becomes something like this. Uh, you may note that we have not considered the blank over here and all of them that is why you have come as one this thing, but if you uh, can uh, get the reverse mapping then uh, using a dictionary breaking it up uh, with these blanks is uh, not difficult. This is mono alphabetic cipher once again uh, it is uh, uh, not difficult to break this for example, you know that um, this uh, once again I am trying to recall. Uh, some of the classical detective stories for example, if you have done something like this and if you have got a fairly uh, long text. Uh, there is a, a statistical uh, table which is available on the internet also uh, about the uh, frequency of occurrences of different letters. For example, E, A etcetera there are some letters like this which occur uh, many more times than uh, letters like J, Q etcetera. Okay. So, this is available. So, using this kind of table you can may, I mean if even if you have a mono alphabetic cipher like this uh, uh, using uh, <coughs> this distribution it is quite uh, possible especially with the help of computers in those detective stories used to be done by the detectives, but now it is a computer would do it. It is possible to guess some of the letters and as you guess more and more uh, it becomes faster and finally, you crack the message. So, this is also not such a great uh, way of uh, encrypting things. Once again we look at this uh, for um, historical purpose. The other approach to encryption is transposition performing sort of permutation on the message letters. For example, uh, if the message says meet me after the toga party you can sort of say uh, let us say this algorithm is simply this. M E then E T M E. So, uh, the point is that alternately you write them in one line or the other line one line or the other line and then you read the top line first M A M A T R etcetera and then followed by the bottom line E T E F etcetera. Uh, once again uh, this is uh, quite easy to um, decipher. Uh, Apart from this there are certain practical problems which you have to uh, consider. One is generating a fully random key is practically very hard sometimes impossible. Now, the and moreover to ensure the security of the system the key size should not be less than the message size. And sending a not repeated key how do you distribute this key amongst the uh, potential senders and receivers sending a not repeated key in same size of the message through a secure channel to the receiver this is uh, impossible. So, I mean the previous uh, ones possibly if we have a very um, long key um, uh, with a length which is uh, comparable to the length of the message then you can uh, have more and more secure um, communication, but having such uh, long key um, e or almost equal to the size of the message distributing it is a problem. So, we now just see what it uh, what we mean today by computational security. Now, an encryption scheme is secure if it takes very long time to break the cipher text. Okay. It is I mean okay, if you are using brute force may be you can break uh, all text, but then uh, breaking the cipher text uh, if it takes a very long time then it becomes infeasible. Now, lifetime is defined in each application for example, military orders may be 1 hour to 3 years. 
check transaction maybe it's for only one year business agreement 10 to 15 years so that is so you uh, i mean if uh, decrypting a message cipher text takes longer than this kind of uh, time then maybe you are doing fine so uh, naturally uh, so the bottom line is that it must take uh, more than several years uh, if somebody does not know anything about the key it must take more than several years to uh, decrypt a message okay now good news with enough number of substitution and transposition modules we can make a strong encryption scheme and this is uh, an algorithm called des or data encryption standard the basic des module uses 56 bit keys okay same keys used to encrypt and decrypt keys used to be difficult to guess need to try 2 to the power 55 different keys on average so modern computers can try millions of keys per second and with special hardware so uh, uh, actually you can make a spe very special machine which can break des but des by itself I mean it is not easy uh, as you can see that you have to make very special hardware for trying out millions of keys per second, uh, millions or even billion keys per second and then uh, it is possible to break this and put a number of machines working in parallel etcetera. So, it is possible to break it in some time frame, but even then this is a very uh, good uh, encryption technique and um, the modern much more difficult uh, encryption techniques are based on DES. So, let us just take a quick look at DES. Actually, one, the current algorithm is advanced encryption standard AES. Uh, it uses 128 bit keys. Adding 1 bit to the key makes it twice as hard to guess. So, must try 2 to the power 127 keys on average to find the right one. At 10 to the power 15 keys per second, this would require over 10 to the power 21 seconds or maybe 1000 billion years. So, this of course, is very good. Modern encryption is not usually broken by brute force. So, what people try to do is that they try to get more information. Um, uh, so, we will not get into the um, uh, attack crypt <coughs> or cryptanalysis part of it, we do not have time. So, this is a basic desk scheme. Suppose, the input is 2 w bits you divide it into two parts w bits and w bits on the other side. These w bits you do an XOR uh, with the output of this function and this function takes this other w bits and a key for this round and these two feed into a nonlinear function uh, which produces an output and this output is XOR with the first w bits. And this XOR now is transposed to the second half and this part comes to the first half. So, this is one round of DES. Actually, DES goes in various rounds. So, in for each round there are uh, keys. Actually, this is generated from one 56 bit keys. So, these uh, keys for the different rounds are generated. I am not going into the details and each time you go through this kind of operation with that particular round key from say k 1 to k 16. In 16 rounds you get the final uh, encrypted text. The decryption also uses the same set of keys only in the reverse order and if you do that you will finally, get the um, decrypted uh, that means, the plain text you will get. So, key size is 56 bits from which the original key size from which all these keys are generated. And uh, nowadays, as I mentioned, that DES, since DES can be broken, uh, people sometimes nowadays use triple DES, and triple DES once again is a modern encryption standard, very difficult to break. So, you require three keys, uh, um, or sometimes only two keys are used KA, KB, and KA once again. So, you take the message, make it uh, go through the DES, first DES block using KA then this encrypted message you encrypt again using k b and this encrypted message you encrypt again using k a and this gives you the cipher text. So, this is once again uh, very difficult to like a s it is very difficult to break. 
Another very important kind of cryptographic technique is the public key cryptography. This is asymmetric key. Till now, we have been talking about the uh, about a symmetric key crypto cryptography. In symmetric key, for the encryption and decryption, you use the same key. Uh, so, if you use the same key as you see, if you are doing a same something like a, uh, a mono alphabetic substitution, uh, that is uh, that table is available to both the parties, the same table. So, that is the same key basically. Similarly, uh, as I mentioned in DES or triple DES, you use the same uh, key or sets of keys in both the cases for both encryption pur purpose as well as for decryption. Now, uh, in the public key cryptography, this is another class of algorithms, where the key that is used for encryption is not the key which is used for decryption. And knowing the key for decryption, it is impossible to guess the key uh, which was used for encryption. So, this is the so called asymmetric key or public key cryptography. It uses two keys. One is known as the public key mainly for encryption and private key which is for decryption. Now, these keys come in pairs. All right. uh, so, what happens is that suppose I want to uh, uh, suppose A wants to send uh, some message to B. Uh, now, what will be available to A will be the uh, public key of B. So, what he is going to do is that he will uh, encrypt it uh, or and he will of course, have his own uh, private key. So, you can uh, do it either way, you can encrypt it using your own uh, private key and then send it since this, uh, but then uh, that can be decrypted with your public key. If somebody else sends it using your public key, then I can decipher it using my private key. And since my private key is not known to anybody, then nobody else can decipher it. That is the basic idea. Another kind of function which is used, once again here the function may be known, which is a trapdoor or one way function. So, uh, let us look at uh, this uh, public key cryptography quickly. Instead of using a single shared secret, keys come in pairs, one key of each pair distributed widely, which is called the public key and one key of each pair kept secret, private or secret key. Two keys are inverses of one another, but not identical. Encryption and decryption are the same algorithm. So, if you encrypt uh, a message m uh, using the secret key, then using the public key if you run the same algorithm, then you will get the deciphered message m. Similarly, if you encrypt it using the public key and then decipher it, that means run the same algorithm again with the secret key, then once again you get m. So, currently the most popular method involves primes and exponentiation. This basically is based on the fact that it is difficult to crack. Uh, um, uh, these uh, encryption unless large numbers can be factored easily and there is no known method for factoring very large numbers. Okay. Uh, of course, we are when I say large number I mean uh, numbers with uh, or integers with a large number of uh, places. All right. So, this is, but uh, that um, difficulty of public key cryptography is that this is very slow for large messages. We also use trapdoor and I will show you later on one uh, very um, uh, important ex example of its use, a trapdoor or one way function. It is computationally impossible to find out what are k and m when knowing the e k m. So, you uh, so knowing m mm, mm, you can of course, use the trapdoor function with this k e to give that e k e m. So, you can go only one in one direction, but from this side it is impossible to come on the other side. This is also sometimes used for authentication in digital signatures as we will see. So, one way functions are functions which given a formula for f x it is easy to evaluate y is equal to f x. Given y computationally infeasible to find any x such that y is equal to f x. 
often operate similar to encryption algorithms, produce fixed length output rather than variable length output, similar to XORing blocks of cipher text together. All right. Uh, um, so, uh, I mean um, common algorithms include MD5, so 128 bit result or SHA1 which is gives you a 160 bit result from a, a text. Now, let us see one important uh, application of all this and this public key and uh, um, one way function etcetera, which is in digital signature. You know a handwritten signature is a function of the signer only, not the message. That means, uh, suppose I sign some document. Uh, now, when I sign some document, uh, this uh, I mean I can sign any number of documents, my signature will remain the same and it is very characteristic of my way of uh, signing, my way of handwriting etcetera, etcetera. So, it is very characteristic of me. So, it is difficult for other people to, I mean it is difficult for ordinary people to um, replicate that, although there are good forgers of course, who can replicate, uh, replicate many, many signatures. Now, um, now, the digital equivalent of a handwritten signature would be useless in e-commerce. So, we must be able to compare it with the real signature and must be sure that it is not copied or forged. Now, how can A, a prove his identity over the internet? That is the basic idea. I, so, when I sign a document, I am basically saying that okay, it is me, uh, me alone who has a, a sort of uh, written this. So, that is why I sign a document or agree to this. Now, how can you do this over a network? Now, this is the basic scheme of a digital signature. So, digital signature is a function of both the signer and the message. A digital signature is a digest of the message encrypted with the signer's private key. So, we have a message M. Uh, so, it may be a very long message. Mm. So, use some secure hash algorithm to produce hash that is the message digest. That means, you uh, make it run through some hashing function which produces an output of a may be a fixed length which is an uh, which is a product of this particular message. All right. Now, you encrypt this hash using the signer's private key. All right. Now, uh, so, so and this produces a signature, this is the digital signature of Mr. A on message M. So, uh, so, so this is the in a, so maybe this is in a slightly better diagram. So, you have the original document, you use a one way function or a hash function, the hash result is now encrypted with the secret key or the private key of the signer, this gives the digital signature. Now, the receiver we should get the original document plus the digital signature. Of course, if you want to now, um, I mean sort of uh, ensure that this does not the original document also should not be seen by anybody, then this entire thing that means, the original document plus the digital signature that you can now encrypt using the public key of the receiver. So, what the receiver will do is that receiver will decrypt it using his own private key, so that he gets back this. Now, the question is that now anybody since a public key may be public, so anybody could have sent this document, how do I know that this actually came from whoever it uh, purports to be? That is where the digital signature uh, part comes in. So, what the receiver what he will do? he can verify by applying one way hash function to the received document. So, he will apply the same hash function to this document. So, he will get, uh, he is supposed to get back whatever was here. Now, he will decrypt the signature using the sender's public key. He has the sender's public key with him. So, and since it was uh, encrypted with the sender's private key, now I can use the uh, private key of the sender to get back the same uh, message. So, comparing the two results equality means document is unmodified, because since the secret key this digital signature could not have been uh, produced by somebody else, because this is a product of this document as well as the secret key of the sender and uh, the secret key of the sender is presumably 
known only to him. So, um, so as I say, if the two hashes are equal, then the message is authentic. Of course, then there is a uh, this does not solve all the problems because sometimes you require some identity documents. What is an identity document? like passport, birth certificate, driver's license, etcetera. This is basically a piece of paper issued by a trusted third party with information verifying the identity of the holder. Now, uh, this has to do with the following. For example, even if you have a digital signature, the digital signature will only tell you uh, that, uh, that it will verify the um, that this message has been sent by somebody who has this particular uh, secret key. That means, secret key corresponding to the public key that the receiver is holding. Now, how, uh, now how do you absolutely guarantee that the secret key is held by the right person? So, that is where the uh, identification uh, comes in. So, uh, so, a challenge is a protocol for holder to prove he is the person named in the document. In ordinary life, we, I mean uh, in, um, in the non-electronic world, we do it through photograph, signature, fingerprint, etcetera. A digital certificate is a digital identity document binding a public private key pair to a specific person or organization. Verifying a digital signature only proves that the signer had the private key corresponding to the public key used to decrypt, decrypt the signature. Does not prove that the public private key pair belong to the claimed individual we need an independent third party to verify the person's identity through non-electronic means and issue a digital certificate. And a digital certificate uh, contains um, uh, all these uh, things, the serial number, name of the holder or I think uh, it we have a, a picture of that anyway. So, this has a public key of the holder, name of the trusted third party then digital signature of the certificate authority, uh, uh, data on which hash and public key algorithms have been used and other business or personal information. The point is that digital signature of the certificate authority and then since this certificate authority is a third party who is trusted. That means, his digital signature, um, if his digital signature is there because the uh, private key of uh, sorry the public key of the certificate authority is known. So, his digital signature can be verified and once you and the and in this particular case this authority is trusted. That means, we know that something bearing the digital signature is indeed coming from that physical uh, trusted authority. And now, this trusted authority is uh, basically certifying that uh, this particular holder, the name of the holder is the holder of this particular public key. That means, he of course, the holder has his own private key, his private key would not uh, be known to anybody else, uh, but then he is the holder of this public key. So, this is the, the other things are sort of, <coughs> so this is the main part. So, we have the version of certificate standard. So, these digital certificates can be checked by a machine that is the whole idea. You have an, uh, ha a hash algorithm and then the message digest issuer's private key and then uh, put the signature of the issuer. Subjects public key is what is being certificate certified. So, this is algorithm identifier plus the uh, public key value and there is a period of validity for, for this. Now, we uh, so, uh, so you see that this uh, public key cryptography is uh, quite an elegant system, only uh, trouble is that uh, this is a rather um, expensive computationally expensive process. So, this is quite uh, slow. Now, pretty good privacy is sort of uses both public and private key uh, to sort of uh, chart a middle course. So, it uses public key encryption to facilitate key distribution, allows messages to be sent encrypted to a person that means, encrypt with the person's public key, allows person to send messages 
that must have come from her that means encrypt with the person's private key. Mm. So, mm, that is the, uh, the problem is that as I said public key encryption is very slow. The solution is to use public key encryption to exchange a shared key. So, shared key is relatively short. So, let us say 128 bits or something. So, message encrypted using the sym symmetric key encryption. Now, what you do is that in the in first phase you use the public key cryptography system to exchange just the just a shared key. This key may be shared just for this very session and then it may go. So, this is uh, shared for this particular session. Uh, so, since this is 128 bits you can do it once even though this is uh, expensive or this is uh, a bit inefficient. And then once you uh, once both the parties are sharing the same key this is a symmetric key. So, this works much faster. So, message is encrypted using the symmetric key encryption. PGP can also be used to authenticate sender use digital signature and send message as uh, uh, plain text. So, there are various ways PGP can be used. We will not go into the details of this. So, with this we come to the um, um, end of our discussion about some security issues which are very general and uh, with which uh, most of the service organizations are uh, very uh, much concerned. Uh, as you know that uh, as I mentioned earlier that <coughs> security is the uh, foundation on which all these so called E activities uh, they are dependent on this security. Now, we will uh, focus a bit more on the uh, network technology part of it that how do you that what we mean by, by the security of a network. Okay. This was security of messages in the network. Now, I am talking about security of the network itself and there are some terms which are uh, quite commonly used. One is uh, one uh, device which is used for securing networks is the use of firewalls. It solves poor internal security measures using the network. Now, this all this has to do with um, securing the functioning of the network. Uh, the other is an intrusion detection system. Sometimes an intrusion detection or intrusion prevention system is integrated with a firewall. Sometimes there are two different boxes. So, intrusion detection is that I want to detect whether any unwanted or unauthorized person has somehow intruded into my uh, secure zone and, and once he in, intrudes into my zone he will have access to data and messages in from my network. So, this I do not want. So, it detects non-network security breaches accomplished via the network. So, this is uh, firewalls and intrusion detection stroke prevention. So, these are very important um, and uh, uh, most of the network vendors have uh, got separate boxes for doing this. So, let us see how uh, they are <coughs> used. By the way, there is also a question of authentication of users and what is used sometimes and uh, you may use distributed authentication or centralized authentication, you may use LDAP or AAA that uh, server for doing that authentication and you can do a distributed cooperation also. This is a typical corporate network okay. uh, and typical corporate network which is meant to be made very secure. So, you see suppose these are the, so we start from the uh, left hand corner, suppose these are the user machines and then we have an internal domain name server, internal mail server, internal web server, internal file server etcetera. This is the private network of the uh, let us say of the corporation, uh, the so called the intranet of the corporation. It is intranet, this term really means that you use the same technology which you use in internet, uh, you use in your internal network also. So, you are you're using things like web browser and DNS and mail server etcetera, which work in the internet, the technology being deployed only for private purpose. So, this left hand part is only for the private purpose and only the these authentic users should be able to use this in intranet and other people although this is connected 
to the that right hand corner you see is the internet. So, although this is connected to the internet other people from the internet uh, people will not generally have access to this part. So, what we do is this internal network we <coughs> try to make it secure using a firewall okay. and this is an internal firewall. And then we have other machines also belonging to the same corporation like its web server which is used for uh, servicing um, other uh, I mean people in the internet. We have mail forwarding and DNS etcetera. Now, these are these are put in a zone which is known as demilitarized, uh, demilitarized zone actually and then this it connects to the external firewall and then the exter this external firewall finally connects uh, to the internet. Actually uh, what happens is that in a firewall what, uh, what a firewall would do is that a firewall would basically um, inspect the packets okay, and decide on whether uh, and, and then it has a lot of rules. A uh, lot of rules which it uses to see whether this packet is ok, it is secure or not. Now, depending on how you configure, it is possible to uh, uh, sort of uh, have different levels of security at various ports of the firewall. A firewall may have 2, 3, 4, 5 ports. Okay. So, suppose it has got 4 ports, it is possible to port wise uh, configure the security level of each of the port. Now, what you want to do is that your internal network of course, you want to make it absolutely secure. So, uh, somebody who wants to an access through this firewall um, into some uh, something which is uh, which is staying in the highly secure zone the absolutely internal core network, then he has to go through a lot of checks alright. So, that is a high security zone, but then uh, again uh, it may uh, happen is that you also have some machines like your web server which you want open to the public. Similarly, your DNS uh, or your mail machine etcetera this have to have public dealing this have to have a public face. So, we want to keep usually some kind of median level security for uh, this kind of machines. So, they are put in a network area which is now known as a demilitarized zone that is DMZ and then a firewall may connect directly to the internet also. So, that part uh, that leg of the firewall would be uh, a very low security or uh, low security zone. So, this may be one way using two firewalls ok. Sometimes people who do not use only one firewall, but uh, so this is a deployment using two firewalls one internal firewall and one external firewall. So, network regions are this internet not secure at all, intranet highly secure and DMZ which is sort of middle level security. And the network boundaries for different all these different regions are at the firewall. So, there may be filtering firewall based on packet headers, there may be different audit mechanism, a proxy may use or may also be used some as some kind of uh, security device. For example, you can use IP addresses for uh, some low level of security. The point is uh, um, I think I mentioned this before about network address translation. Okay. This came up because uh, as we discussed earlier that uh, our um, uh, IPv4 uh, these addresses have really virtually run out okay, only some few class C addresses are available uh, otherwise they are not uh, as such available. So, in order to obviate that what we did was that in the internal network we use some private IP um, addresses and when we use a private IP address uh, in my network. So, if in order to communicate you have to go through a proxy and the proxy will remember that okay, this private address machine with this private address was wanting is wanting to communicate with outside world. So, he puts in place of this private address which is not really valid outside, he puts a valid IP address from a pool and then sends out the request gets the message and then sends it to this private IP. It is uh, conventional 
to uh, number the private IP addresses uh, starting with 10, okay. 10 dot something 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 dot something dot something. So, that is a class A address, one full class A address which is a huge address space uh, for one organization. And the point is the uh, uh, routers outside, they are uh, not going to um, route any, uh, uh, usually not going to route any address uh, with a, which has a, which starts with 10 dot, because it is known that 10 dot is used for uh, private IP. So, if you use um, private IP addresses, it is difficult for outsiders from the internet to log on to your machine, uh, unless he is uh, going through some proxy or something and getting some, uh, getting into your network in the first place. So, network address translation protocol maps internal to assigned addresses. While forwarding mail, you may hide internal addresses, map incoming mail to real server and additional incoming or outgoing checks may be put. So, these are all different things you can do to enhance the security of your network. Uh, it is not possible to make your uh, network 100 percent uh, um, safe, but you can increase the level of safety through various measures. So, this is one kind of measure. This is of course, apart from any firewall that you might have put. For firewall configuration, the external fire one, what traffic, what you can uh, configure it saying that what traffic are allowed, okay. External source, so you may put IP restriction. So, external source may only be from this and this or this IP addresses, you can uh, sort of specify that. Or what type of traffic? Uh, or ports, maybe for example, whether it is SMTP for mail or HTTP for web, etcetera, what kind of traffic I will allow and what kind of traffic I will not allow. Maybe I will not allow telnet in the secure zone at all from outside. Proxy between DMZ servers and internet and proxy between inner and outer firewalls. So, these are the things which you can, which you can configure in an um, external firewall. Of course, as, um, the, as I said, that the network uh, security has become such a burning issue these days and so uh, more and uh, more development is taking place in this region and especially in firewall design etcetera. So, a modern firewall not only works very fast, it can look at a lot of things, okay. it can uh, sort of counter uh, peer to peer uh, messages and all kinds of things it can uh, handle. So, it is not possible to go into all the things. This is just a very introductory uh, idea about the firewall. For internal firewall, you can put traffic restrictions on ports from or to IP addresses and you can proxy between intranet and outside. So, these are the things you can do with the firewall. For DMZ administration, uh, whether the direct control ac console access is required. Okay. If your direct console access is required, then naturally this is another place. So, this is somewhat troublesome or you can use special access using SSH uh, that secure shell connection allowed from internal to DMZ administration connection or only from some specific internal IP or th only through internal firewall etcetera, you can administer the DMZ. So, this reduces the security risk to only uh, one or a few machines. Now, you can authenticate in various ways. Uh, one question of course, always comes up that whether your authentication will scale. Uh, so, you can repeat the authentication, have multiple administration, but it is always uh, this thing. So, it is if you have a distributed authentication scheme, um, then that is always good. Now, let us look at some attacks and defenses. One kind of attack which is common is a denial of service attack, routing attack, spoofing attack and maybe there are other kinds of attacks that people are also thinking. Because as people are making things more secure, uh, the hackers and other people also are thinking of more ways of uh, <coughs> compromising the security. Confidentiality on the network uh, is manageable, encryption to protect transmission, public key cryptography etcetera, key management. Integrity is reducible to single system and digital signatures and commit protocols handle network failure. 
but what about availability that is this is where the attacks on the networks come into picture one is flooding this is a denial of service kind of attack okay that means overwhelm the tcp stack on target machine this prevents legitimate connection routing attack is misdirect your traffic spoofing that somebody is entering your network claiming to be uh, somebody um, but the claiming uh, a false identity actually so it imitates a legitimate source so what is a flood attack let us see there is usually a sin flood limit the availability by overwhelming service by following services protocol uh, to an extent example is a sin flood it overwhelms the tcp stack or example may be a large number of emails being generated by a script. Let us look at SYN flood. You remember that TCP protocol that when a client initiates a SYN and then it waits, then uh, the server will uh, acknowledge it and send a sequence number. Mm. So, sir, sir, server will also send a SYN and then it will wait for the acknowledgement from the client. So, this is a multi step process when sequence numbers are uh, incremen uh, incremented for future messages, ensure message order and re retransmit if lost. Now, what some malicious person might do is that receive the SYN, uh, it, uh, re um, the server receives the SYN, allocates connection, acknowledges and waits for the response from the other side, waits for this response. So, what this fellow is doing is that it is sending one scene after the other and a rapid succession. So, he is also opening the server on the server side, he will be opening so many connections, he will send acknowledgement and wait. So, the uh, what will happen is that all space for connections become uh, allocated and somebody who is, a, I mean this of course, is a malicious user, but somebody who is um, uh, I mean a legitimate user he can no longer get any access to this uh, server because the uh, server has become uh, absolutely overwhelmed. So, this is a denial of service. So, we can limit connections from one source, ignore connections from illegitimate sources, uh, drop oldest connection items. So, these things people try and what the firewall would do is also firewall would also or for intrusion detection system would try to detect that and then block the all the um, flood of sins etcetera which is coming from uh, maybe one source, but that does not solve the distributed denial of service attack which is coming from many sources. Network solution is TCP intercept um, uh, router establishes connection to client when connected establishes with the server. So, router comes in between the server and the client or SYN kill, monitor machine as a firewall, good addresses, history of successful connection you allow, otherwise you kill. So, these are some of the intrusion prevention kind of situation. So, this is um, one kind, you can try to encrypt your SYN or take, make changes in the protocol also, but that is usually uh, more difficult and cumbersome to implement unless it is your own private network absolutely. Service level flooding overload the server, its processing, its storage, typically a garbage request using legitimate protocol, large e emails to victim, many HTTP connections, heavy use of scripts. So, these sort of overwhelm the server in some other way, so that he cannot give legitimate service. Finally, one IP spoofing. Uh, I will uh, tell you that uh, what you can what somebody can do is that instead of overwhelming the server he can overwhelm the client and then take on the role of the client. So, as I said there are various ways in which uh, these ne network attacks are coming and there are ways to uh, sort of uh, try to handle this. Uh, so, this is a very developing field and uh, important field also. So, we are just taking given an overview today. Thank you.